My name is Mike Meredith. I'm the doctor of Doctor's Woodshop and we're back again at Northwoods Figured Woods to make another in the instructional videos for my website doctorswoodshop.com. In this segment I want to talk about the bottle stopper. Now the bottle stopper is a, a fun little project. They're easy. There's no real special equipment required for it although there's a lot that can be bought for it. And it's a great way to use up the little bits of wood you have sitting around your shop. Nothing goes to waste in a wood turner shop. I started making bottle stoppers seriously about the same time I started going out and doing demonstrations of the Doctor's Wood Shop products. Coincidentally, it was also about the same time my daughter was getting married. My wife said, wouldn't it be nice if you made something for everyone coming to the reception? And I said, well, yes, it would. How many are there? 85. That left out a whole lot of different wood turning projects, but since the wedding was at a winery, the, wine, the bottle stopper, the wine stopper, seemed an appropriate reception gift. And I learned that when you're out on demonstrations and talking about finishes, you need something to finish. And the bottle stopper is a, is a quick, easy little project that you can do such that you're never more than about two minutes away from finishing something. The bottle stopper is completely up to you. You can look like anything you want. The only key is that the shape really needs to be fairly simple. The extended sphere, the actual sphere, the elongated whatever that is. The only rule is you never put a point on top of a bottle stopper because invariably someone is going to go and the rest, you know, you, you can imagine. It's up to you. They're fun. They're easy. They're quick. There really are two kinds of bottle stoppers. Um, there are the kinds with the, the cork, like these, the quick, easy, fast, inexpensive ones. You can buy the corks pre-drilled. I get my stuff from Packard uh, Woodworking, and, but you can get them just about anywhere. Now the cork bottle stopper involves a piece of wood that you've drilled with a 3 8 inch hole slip the stopper, in, slip the, the dowel into it with a, a coat of glue and you let it dry for at least 24 hours. Because the interior of that hole is excluded from air, the glue will set up very slowly. I like the Packard dowel simply because they're the ones that have the grooves in it that allow you some movement of glue as well as compression of the wood within the hole. To turn the dowel based um, bottle stopper, you can do it a couple ways. You can hold the dowel in a Jacob's chuck and turn using the Jacob's chuck to hold the dowel in place. The method that I use that I prefer is a draw collet. Now this is a, a fancy draw collet from Best Wood Tools. I do this often enough that, that the, the bearing driven collet became worthwhile. The draw collet is an old machinist tool that allows you just in, to insert then as you draw, the Morris Taper 2 of your headstock compresses that and holds the dowel in place. Why do I prefer the draw collet? Well, the Jacob's chuck works just fine, but it really only holds the dowel in three places. The draw collet closes around the dowel and holds it securely through 360 degrees. Now, if you're going to use a draw collet, you really don't need one of the, the fancy ones. You can get a piece of, of all thread and a star nut and that will do the same thing going through the headstock and drawing the collet back into the Morris taper. The other type of bottle stopper uses a metal base and there are all kinds of them. These are actually my two favorites. This is the old uh, standby cylindrical, the classic look of the metal stopper. It has a 3 8 by 16 TPI thread on the end of it so you have to thread your block uh, when you hold it in place. The same is true for this one. This is a fairly new variety. This one actually will stop the bottle. It's a compression fitting that will actually close the bottle and truly stop it. Again, it has the 3 8 by 16 TPI thread on the end. Now, I've started using those metal fittings for this sort of blank. These are burl alumalite resin hybrids. The maple burl is from right here at Northwoods Figured Woods. The alumalite resin hybrids are made by Beyond Wood Products in St. Louis. So the wood goes from Oregon to St. Louis back to Oregon. To, to tap these, you treat them just like a piece of metal, only a little more gently. 
a uh, nine millimeter hole in the bottom, then a standard cap, which you can handle with the, the sort of tap handle that everyone has, or you can get fancier tap handles for ratcheting. Either way, what you're doing is cutting a thread into the base such that when you're done, you can simply thread the, the stopper on. Now to hold the threaded blanks, you can do it a, a couple of ways. There are this sort of chuck adapter that will go directly onto a one inch eight TPI drive, or you can make your own. If you can make it, why buy it? If you take a 3 8 16 inch bolt, work the head off of it, and hold this in the Jacobs chuck, you can then screw your, your threaded block directly onto that and turn, uh, turn your threaded wine bottle top that way. So, all sorts of little tools, most of which you've probably already got. Okay, so how do we make a bottle stopper? Well, the first thing, since you're working with a small piece of wood and you don't really want to deal with the indentation from your live center, if you have the one-way style live center, pull the, the, the cone off, take the point out, and really that, that little cup center is all the pressure you need to hold, hold the, the the blank in place. So onto our draw bar, put our draw collet in. Set the, the blank in, draw down the collet, and we're just about ready to go. Now, like any other turning project, you need to protect your eyes, you need to protect your lungs, although I'll forego the mask for this one. I, I think it'll be all right. And protect your ears. My daughter, the audiologist, is on me constantly about ear protection. So we'll try to turn very quietly today. Once everything is in place, just snug that up and we're ready to make a bottle stopper. All right, the first thing that we need to get done is to, first of all, round the block, square the end, and I cut a little divot, a little relief underneath so that when you put the cork on, it will sit more snugly up against the base of the, turn, of the, of the, the block. Then we're gonna cut a little pl a platform and then actually start with the, with the shape. So, first things first, square to, to round, and then put the base uh, the perpendicular. Okay, so we've gone now almost to a round. We still got a little bit of a flat side left. We'll take down. Now, next step is to square the base so it's perpendicular to the line of the um, dowel. And at the same time, At the same time, I've cut the relief underneath uh, the surface. To get a, a better cork fit. Okay, I'm just moving to spindle gouge. In this case, a half inch spindle gouge. Cut the little plateau. It 
flows into the shape of the of the um, the rest of the stopper if you angle that up just slightly. The shape of the stopper can be anything you want. Who knows what a wine stopper looks like? It's like a honey dipper. Who knows what a honey dipper looks like? Um, it can be round, extended spheres. Uh, Nick Cook makes a sort of top hat uh, bottle stopper that looks very nice. This one's going to be sort of the, the piece, the, the shape the wood gave me, uh, an extended cone. That little bottom there is sort of like turning just a, a tiny little sphere. And you leave the tailstock in place as long as you can, but eventually you're going to have to move that away. Okay, so I've cut the relief under the bottom and I've moved it back into the um, uh, draw collet to hold it a little more securely. Uh, I've taken most of the top off. There's still just a little bit of a, a mark there from, um, from the, the, the ring, but we'll count on sandpaper to take care of that. Now this is a piece of coca bolo, and normally I would never use coca bolo in a public demonstration, except that with a sanding lubricant you contain so much of the dust that it's not really a problem. Now, we always, we, woodturners seem to forget that sandpaper is the last cutting tool. These are pieces of very sharp glass that we're putting over the surface of the wood. We're in fact cutting it. So using the sandpaper as a shaping tool is perfectly acceptable. Now to use the sanding lubricant, this is the walnut finishing oil, although my bottle has lost its label long since, walnut finishing oil that I find speeds up and improves the quality of sanding significantly. It allows us to move through a lot of grits of sandpaper very quickly. Simply apply a few drops to the, to the sandpaper and we're starting with a, a 220 grit sandpaper. If you're not getting the equivalent of about 150 grit finish off your tools, you need to be working on sharpening. Sharp tools are the cure for almost any wood turning product problem and they'll go a long way toward improving your turning plus making it a whole lot more fun. Now that's got kind of a flat spot on it. I don't want to leave in there. Now you notice I didn't slow the lathe down any. With a sanding lubricant, you can, you can sand at high speed because you're not going to get heat checking. The sandpaper heats the surface of the wood. The moisture in the wood, particularly things like coca bolo, ebony, um, red heart, the oily woods, lignum vitae, have oil in the wood. The heat expands the oil. The oil expanding cracks the wood. Heat checking. And a heat check is a problem that you can't sand out because it goes down into the wood as well as along the surface. So we're just going to zip through the, the grits here. 220, 360. And once you've got the shape you want, it doesn't really take very long to get the surface To the degree of shine that we uh, are looking for. Three sixty, four hundred, three 
Now the sandpaper I'm using is the Clinspore cloth back J weight sandpaper. Um, a lot of people make good sandpaper. I have always used Clinspore because I have never had a problem. I've never had a 100 grit stone in a 400 grit piece of paper. And I suspect all of you have. I have too. 400 600 I notice there's no dust the dust is going into this little this little burnishing compound that actually is polishing the surface of the wood while it's sanding I think that's the reason why a sanding lubricant allows you to move very quickly through the grits all right now there's 600 a lot of projects I would stop there, but because a, um, a bottle stopper is a, is a showpiece, uh, people look at them closely, we're going to go up a little higher just to show you what can be done. What I'm doing is washing the surface with some clean walnut oil. And now we'll bring out what I call my little sandpaper book. This is wet dry sandpaper from 1,000 to 5,000 grit, all stapled together, nicely ordered, so I don't have to go looking for it. And it really takes just an instant with these high grit papers. And again, the sanding lubricant speeds up the process and gives you a much nicer finish, I think, in the end. 1,000, 1500. Notice it also doesn't take much in the way of a piece of paper. So a sheet of 1000 grit sandpaper will last a very long time. Now you can find these wet dry papers at any auto supply store. Uh, go to their uh, refinishing aisle and you'll find sandpaper, you know, the wet dry silicon carbide papers um, from 1,000 up to 5,000 at a good price. If you remember nothing else that I tell you in all these videos, remember this. In wood turning, surface is everything. No finish is any better than the surface upon which it's put. I make finishing products, I want them to look as good as they can on your project, which means I need to get you to think about what you need to do to perfect the surface. I started using sandpaper this high a grit for the Alumalite uh, resin hybrid blanks and found that it doesn't take very long, it's not very much work, and it really gives you a gorgeous finish. That I think was 3,000. We went through 1,500, 2,000, 2,500, 3,000, 4,000. And it was, this isn't going to need much of a finish on it at all. But of course we will put one on. 4,000. And no, that was 3,000. This is 4,000. I staple them together in order because they all look pretty much the same. They're the same color and they have the same color backing on them. So unless you catch a piece that's got a number on it, can't really be sure what it is. There's 4,000, 5,000. As you can see, I'm just using a, probably about a square inch. But I'm keeping the sanding lubricant along with each grade. The finer the sandpaper, the more heat it will generate, the more friction you can get, uh, simply because you've got more pieces rubbing on the wood. Okay, that's sanded up through 5,000. Didn't take that long. I'll wash the, the surface. A few drops of, fresh drops of walnut oil, and I will friction polish it. A lot of you have asked me what do I mean by friction polishing? Well, I mean applying heat, applying friction to the surface of the piece, polishing what's on there. And by heat, 
I mean you need to feel the heat of the surface coming through the towels. What we're doing is driving, by heating the, the walnut oil, driving it into the wood, and we start the polymerization of the walnut oil to form that plastic coat. There we are. Now, we can let that dry buff it again, but I'm going to put onto it an oil wax shellac. This is the Pens Plus um, friction polish. And we just drop it onto the piece. And friction polish each layer. Again, the heat is required because it's driving the walnut oil into the wood. It's drying the shellac, but it's melting the wax. Now this is a microcrystal wax. This is one of the synthetic waxes that I use the Cosmoid ADH synthetic wax. We melt the wax and we let it flow across the surface. Now between coats, I let it sit for a while. It takes about 30 seconds, 45 seconds for the shellac to cool. The shellac is dry, we're not letting it dry, but we're letting it cool such that when I go back in, I'm not gonna deform the shellac layer. And we're also letting the wax set up so that now with the the next layer, when we go to friction polish it, we melt the wax. The wax comes back to the surface. Another layer of shellac goes underneath it. A good thing to remember is don't let the towel slip out. Your finger on the surface will generate significant heat, and it does hurt. So, a few more drops. And I found about three coats of either the Pens Plus or the Walnut Oil Wax Shellac Wood Turning Finish gives you a nice finish a good look, and more coats don't really improve it. Improve it. It's not like the high build friction polish where you can just apply coats all day long and build and build and build on that depth of uh, finish. There we go. Now to take it out, so you know, undo the draw collet. We'll then put a couple of drops of glue onto the, um, the dowel, slip the cork over it, and we're done. So the last step, once the glue is dried, is to sand down the dowel. And, you know, we forget that our lathe is actually just a rotary tool waiting for new attachments. This is just a piece of, of wood that I've cut a tenon that'll fit in the chuck. Uh, put some Velcro on the front, and voila, you have a disc sander. Which goes a little faster than it probably should have been. There we are. Just sand it off smooth, put a drop of wax on it to seal the wood, and there's our bottle stopper finished. Finishing a bottle stopper is like finishing a pen, like finishing anything else. Surface is everything. And the better you can make that look, the better your finish is going to look once you apply it. I have queued up here one of the uh, Alumalite and uh, Maple Burl hybrid blanks for a bottle stopper. It's threaded onto the, the bolt holder that's been trapped in the, the draw collet. And as you can see, I've got it started rounding out. The Alumalite is, um, cuts very delicately once you get it roughed out. But in the roughing process, a face guard is always a good idea.
The problem with a hybrid blank like this is that the alumilite, although you can cut it, it really prefers to be scraped. The wood, although it's been embedded with plastic and cactus juice, prefers to be cut. So you wind up going back and forth between you know, reduction methods and, and uh, you try not to forget which is which. Okay, so we'll clear away the um, plastic strands and start sanding. The sanding for one of these is done exactly the same as uh, with a wooden blank. We start with the, um, the Clinx 4 paper and then move up into the, um, the wet dry papers. Now just to start sanding, I'm going to start with about an 80 grit which is coarser than I would normally use in part because the alumilite in the roughing stage tends to come off in chunks and there are some small little divots here that we just need to get past before we start doing anything. Even at 80 grit you can use a sanding lubricant to keep the dust down. You can definitely see the burnishing compound forming on this one. Jump to 220. Still actually finishing up some shaping details. A little light as a material is very interesting. It sands pretty much at the same rate the wood does. And it behaves with sanding uh, very much as wood does. So it's a good choice for the wood plastic hybrids. Much better, I think, than acrylic, which is much more brittle than wood. Mm -hmm. Alumilite is a polyphenoxy as opposed to a polyacrylic resin. And in my as yet limited experience, it behaves a lot better than uh, the acrylic resins. By that, I mean, I mean it simply behaves more like wood. through the Clings 4 cloth back. J. Wade shop rolls. Okay, before we go on, let's clear the sanding residue. Now, although the wood has been preserved, it still benefits from embedding the oil into the surface. Now, you can see even at 600, we've produced a, a fairly nice look on the, um, the alumilite. And by the time we're done, that will 
look like we're standing on a cliff looking down into an orange sea of some sort. So we're ready to start with a wet dry paper. The wonderful thing about the Alumalite resins with the um, well, maple burl in this case, but we've also done buckeye burl, is that the prettiest part of the burl is right at the surface. That's the part you can never keep. You always wind up turning that away in your project. With these hybrid blanks, we're actually turning to the prettiest parts. So we preserve um, the best part of the burl as a focal point of the blank. 1,000, 1,500, When I first started working with the Illumilite resin, suddenly I heard the voice of my seventh grade shop teacher, Mr. Clark, who said, you always wet sand plastic. So I started using my finishing oil as a wet sand, and it works very well. It actually behaves, again, very wood-like, but it allows us to sand faster because the Illumilite will melt if the sanding isn't lubricated. So there, Mr. Clark, I was awake and I was paying attention. Now the wood is really pretty much done by the time we get up to this is, looks like 2,500 or 3,000. But the, the Illumilite prospers from the additional sanding. It looks pretty good at 1,000. But the additional clarity you get by sanding through the rest of the grits is well worth the few minutes it's going to take to do it. And with the Lumalite, as with wood, surface is everything. Take the time to perfect the surface and you'll never regret how the piece looks. Alright, 5,000 and clean it off. Pretty nifty. We'll finish it with uh, Pens Plus Micro Crystal uh, Walnut Oil Shellac Finish. More for the wood than the Illumilite, but the Illumilite seems to benefit from the wax. Again, it's like any other friction polish. And again, just a little spot of the micro crystal wax, paste wax as a finishing top coat. Again, more for the Illumilite than the wood, but. So now all I have to do is mount it on the base. We just screw in the base. There we are. A maple burl alumilite uh, resin blank. Blank produced by Beyond Wood Products in St. Louis. Very dramatic. <laughs>